Howdy, welcome to another video based on the textbook First Course in Mathematical Logic by Patrick Supps and Shirley Hill. This is primarily just on section 2.6 by conditional sentences. Let's look at our new sentential connective, namely the biconditional sentential connective. It's the if and only if connective, or IFF for short. P if and only if Q. And we could symbolize it with a arrow that goes in both directions. So this is in contrast with a conditional, which has an arrow only going one direction. For example, if P, then Q. And as we'll see in a moment, it makes a lot of sense to have the arrow go in both directions with a biconditional. So for example, on page 104, these fields are flooded if and only if the water reaches this height. Now, a biconditional sentence is equivalent to two conditional sentences. So if we have P, if and only if Q, this means the same thing as the conditional if P then Q and the conditional if Q then P. So if we go back to our example, we can get from that biconditional two conditionals. If the fields are flooded, then the water reaches its height. And also, if the water reaches its height, then the fields are flooded. So if P then Q, and if Q then P. So this is logically equivalent to P if and only if Q. Now the if and only if connective by default is strongest. So say we have this example with three sentential connectives. Well, how do we read that? Well, given that the if and only if connective is strongest, if we want to put parentheses to make this more clear, we could do it the following way. We can put a parenthesis set around if P then Q and around S and P. Because the strongest connective always must be outside the parentheses. Now from that, let's think about the law for biconditional sentences. For given the premise P if and only if Q, what could we immediately infer from that? Well, think about what a biconditional sentence is. So here, the antecedent and consequent have a different relationship than a straightforward conditional sentence because the antecedent, in this case, is both sufficient and necessary for the consequent. And likewise, the consequent is both sufficient and necessary for the antecedent. So from the premise, P if and only if Q, we can derive three things. We can get if P then Q, we can get if Q then P, and the conjunctive sentence that combines the first two conclusions, if P then Q and if Q then P. Okay, because P is both sufficient and necessary for Q, unlike a conditional sentence. Likewise, if we're given two premises with premise A telling us if P then Q and premise B telling us if Q then P, what could we infer from that? We can get P if and only if Q. Because P is both sufficient and necessary for Q, and Q is both sufficient and necessary for P. Let's work on exercise 17, part C from pages 105 to 106, where to symbolize completely the premises and conclusion of each of the following arguments and give a formal derivation. So let's look at number one. This piece of legislation will be passed this session if and only if it is supported by the majority party. We have a biconditional sentence. So I'll say P if and only if M. Either it is supported by the majority party or the governor opposes it. You have a disjunction. I'll symbolize it as M or O, and please forgive me for any typos. If the governor opposes it, then it will be delayed in the committee deliberations. So we can say if O, then D. Therefore, either this piece of legislation will be passed this session or it will be delayed in committee deliberation. So therefore, P or D. So that's symbolized. Now, is that a valid inference? 
Well, let's apply our new rule, our biconditional law. So for our fourth sentence, we can get, for example, if P, then M, so this is the law of biconditions from sentence one, and we can also derive if M, then P, it's also the law of bicondition from sentence one. Now, well, we can derive what we want now, right? So for a sixth sentence, we can get therefore P or D. Why? Because we have a constructive dilemma with sentences two, three, and five. We didn't need sentence four, but it doesn't help to write that out or derive that in any case. Because notice from our second sentence, M or O, but if it's M, then we'll get P. And if it's O, then it'll be D. So the choice has to be P or D. Let's move on to number two. The sun rises and sets if and only if the earth rotates. Let's symbolize our first sentence. So we can say S if and only if E. The earth rotates and the moon revolves around the earth. So we have for second sentence E and M. Therefore, the sun rises and sets or the climate is very hot or cold. So therefore, S or C. So that's the argument. Is that inference valid from those two premises? Let's apply the law of biconditional sentences. So for our third sentence, we can derive if E, then S. This is a, the law of biconditional sentences. So I'm using sentence one there. We can also immediately derive E from simplification of sentence two. Now we can derive S is the case because of modus ponens of sentences three and four. So um, if E and S, E, e so therefore S. And so with our sixth sentence, we can, by the law of addition, get S or C from sentence five. Okay. S is the case, so that can be put in a disjunctive relationship with, with anything whatsoever. So S or C does in fact validly follow those two premises. Let's look at number three. We have a various mathematical statements, but we're going to symbolize those with, with letters. So we have um, three times five equals 12, if and only if five plus five plus five equals 12. And let's just assign it A, if and only if B. The second premise is four times four does not equal 13. So for our second premise, we'll just say not C to represent that statement. Then we have a conditional, so five plus five Plus 5 equals 12 implies 4 times 4 is 13. So for our third premise, we have if B, then C. Okay. So notice it's using C, but it's in the affirmative, so to speak. So therefore, 3 times 5 does not equal 12. So we should be able to derive from that, not A. Does that follow? Is that valid? So we'll take these three premises and see what we can infer from them. So for a fourth sentence, we have if B then C, not C. So for a fourth sentence, we can say not B by modus tollens, sentences two and three. For our fifth sentence, we can get um, we can get if A, then B, because this is the law of biconditionals. This is from sentence one. 
or sixth sentence, um, we could say not A by modus tollens, the sentences four and five. So not A does in fact follow. Let's continue with the last three problems of exercise 17, part C. Number four, the land can be cultivated if and only if a means of irrigation is supplied. I'll symbolize that as L if and only if I. It's a biconditional, obviously. If the land can be cultivated, then it will be worth three times its present value. Symbolize it's if L, then W. Therefore, if a means of irrigation is supplied, then the land will be worth three times its present value. Symbolized, therefore, if I, then W. So is that a valid argument? So from these two premises, can we get if I, then W? Let's find out. Well, for the heck of it, let's just apply the law of biconditional sentences or the rule of biconditional sentences. So for our third sentence, we can get if L then I. It's a law by conditions from sentence one. Likewise, I'm just applying this um, you know, without thinking, really. If you think ahead, we'll see that um, there's this, um, that derivation there was superfluous, but that's all right. We also get if I then L. So now what? Well, we do have if I then L and if L then W. So we have a hypothetical syllogism. So for five, it is indeed the case that if I then W, because we have a hypothetical syllogism, the sentences uh, two and four. We didn't need sentence three, but that's all right. We can still keep it there, a sentence three. But it's always best to try to think ahead, like you're playing a game of chess, so you don't have to write out uh, more derivations than you than you need. So it's best to be economical when doing these types of problems. Let's look at number five. A liquid is acid if and only if it turns blue litmus paper red. For the heck of it, I'll just assign the letters A and B. A if and only if B. A liquid turns blue litmus paper red if and only if it contains free hydrogen ions. So we can symbolize that as B if and only if F. Therefore, a liquid is an acid if and only if it contains free hydrogen atoms. So therefore, A if and only if So from these two premises, what can we get? Can we validly infer A if and only if F? For a third sentence, we'll just try if A then B. This is the law by conditions from sentence one. For four, let's try if B then F, the law of by conditions from sentence two. And I did that for a reason because we, we see that we have a hypothetical syllogism, if A, then B, if B, then F. So for our fifth sentence, we can get if A, then F, because we have a hypothetical syllogism with sentences three and four. For our sixth sentence, we can get if B, then A, the law of by conditional for sentence one, Likewise, for a seventh sentence, we can get um, if um, F then B, law by conditionals from sentence two. Notice once again, we have um, for, uh, we, for a seventh sentence, we have if F then B, but if B then A. So we have another uh, hypothetical syllogism. So for our eighth sentence, we can get um, if F then A. Remember, we want to prove that A if and only if F. So if we look 
at our derivation so far, we have um, if f then a, and we also have if a then f. So for our ninth sentence, we could indeed conclude a if and only f, the law of biconditional sentences with 5 and 8. So we have if a then f, if f then a, so therefore a if and only if f. Finally, number six, it's a little bit tricky because you have that not the case. So we'll have to think about this a little bit. So we have if it is not the case that if an object floats on water, then it is less dense than water, then you can walk on water. So what's happening here? Well, the comma helps. This comma here helps a lot, I think, because the not the case is really applying to this conditional here, which is the antecedent, and here what follows from this then is the, the consequent. So if we symbolize that, we can get not parentheses if f then l close parentheses then w. But you can walk on water. Well, to symbolize that is not w. If an object is less dense than water, then it can displace its own weight in water. And I'll symbolize that if L, then D. If it can displace its own weight in water, then the object will float on water. So we can symbolize that as if D, then F. Therefore, an object will float on water if and only if it is less dense than water. So therefore, F if and only if D. So let's see what we can do here. So we want to prove that it is fact it is in fact the case that f if and only if d given the four premises. Well notice right away with sentence one and two, we have with sentence two a not w, so we're denying the consequence, so we can thereby deny the antecedent. So for our fifth sentence. We can get not, not, if f then l, because of modus tollens with sentences 1 and 2. Then by double negation, we can get if f then l from sentence 5. Now notice what we have so far. With sentence 6, we have if f then l but sentence 3 tells us if l then d so we have a hypothetical syllogism so for 7 if f then d we have a hypothetical syllogism with 6 and 3 we want to prove f if only if d so far we have if f then d but we also have, for our fourth sentence, if D then F, so for eight, we can therefore conclude F if and only if D by the law of the biconditional with sentences seven and four. Let's work on number 10 from exercise 17, part D, and this will be our final problem in this video. We have a proof to do, and we're given four premises. It's always a good idea, by the way, to pause the video and try these problems for yourself. What should we do? Well, the first thing I think is to find overlap between the premises. If there was no overlap whatsoever, we probably would be in big trouble. But we do have overlap. In sentence one, we have this x is not less than y. In sentence two, we have this x is not less than y. Can we interrelate sentences one and two? We could get a hypothetical syllogism out of that, but it's not ready yet because sentence two is a biconditional. So we're going to want to immediately infer a conditional sentence 
and have it such that we could validly get a hypothetical syllogism. So for our fifth sentence, we can say if x is not less than y, then y is equal to zero. And this is just the law of biconditional sentences, and we're using sentence two. But now we do have a hypothetical syllogism because we have in the first sentence if x and y, then x is not less than y. But the sentence five has if x is not less than y, then y is equal to zero. So therefore, if x is equal to y, then y is equal to zero. By the hypothetical syllogism rule, we're using sentences one and five. And notice that sentence six shows up as the antecedent to a conditional with sentence four. So we could infer x is equal to zero by modus ponens. So for seven, we can say x does equal zero because we have a modus ponens inference with four and six. Now x is equal to zero does show up in sentence three. Now overall, that is a conditional sentence. So if we had parentheses, they would, they would be right here. Now in one sense, I want to say that couldn't we just by modus ponens infer that y is equal to zero? Because after all, there's only two options, well, three options really, with the antecedent, x equals zero or x, y equals zero, or both are the case. But if we want to be technical here, we really should be affirming the entire antecedent, okay? And that antecedent is a disjunction. So we have or x, y equals zero. So by the law of addition, we can work with sentence seven. So for sentence eight, we can say x is equal to zero or x, y is equal to zero. We could validly do that with the law of addition with sentence seven. And now we can affirm that antecedent to get that y does equal zero by modus ponens with sentences three and eight. And y equals zero shows up in sentence two, but sentence two is a biconditional sentence. So let's engage in the law of biconditional sentences once again. So for sentence 10, we can get um, if y is equal to zero, then x is not less than y by the law of biconditionals. And this is with sentence two. And now with sentences nine and 10, we can say that x is not less than y by modus ponens with sentences nine and 10. We're getting closer. We want to prove, prove this and we have one part of it, well, at least almost. We have this contradictory, right? We want x is less than y. We have x is not less than y. But notice that the sentence we want to prove is a negative sentence, and that negative sentence itself is molecular. It's a big conjunction, right? So we're probably going to want to use De Morgan's law. So let's work with sentence 11 Okay, so if we were using De Morgan's law, we can move from a disjunction to a conjunction without a problem. So for our 12th sentence, we could say X is not less than Y, or, well, we could try X is equal to one. So this would be the law of addition uh, from sentence 11. But I actually think this is gonna be a big problem, okay, with X is equal to one, because we're going to have to negate that. But let's just see what happens, and we can correct ourselves uh, later if, if there's an error. So from 12, let's engage in double negation. So we'll say not, not, parentheses, x is not less than y, or x is equal to 1. So we have a double negation, sentence 12. And with this not, we can engage in De Morgan's law. So for 14, we can say not, parentheses, not, x is not less than y, and we're using D Morgan, so we could switch to a conjunction, x does not equal one. We're negating that x is equal to one. So this is D Morgan 
with sentence 13. But as I said, there's a problem there because that's not what we want. We have x is not equal to 1, but we want x is equal to 1. So it's really this that has to be fixed. We should have started out in our um, gauging the law of addition. We should have said x is not equal to 1. Okay, so let's just disregard what we did and just fix that. And that's okay if we run into a dead end. So for sentence 15, we'll say x is not less than y or x does not equal 1. And this is the law of addition with sentence 11. So we're disregarding sentence 12, 13, and 14. And again, as I said, that's perfectly okay. For 16, let's again do double negation. Okay, it's double negation of sentence 15. And then we will use De Morgan's law. So for 17, get not parentheses not x is not less than y, and so we're moving to a conjunction, x is equal to 1. Okay. Maybe I should have said not here. Maybe I should just go like that to be consistent. And then we then we apply double negation. Okay, apply double negation here, and here. So then we'll get for 18, we'll get not parentheses x is less than y, and x is equal to one. And we have proved what we wanted. Kind of neat. Yeah, I did notice the one mistake. So for sentence 17, I said I was applying De Morgan's law to sentence 13, but in fact, I was applying it to sentence 16. Small mistake. But anyways, um, section 2.7 is just a summary of the rules of inference, at least for propositional logic. I don't see a need really to go over all these. Now these here don't appear in the Substance Hill textbook, which is unfortunate. But at any rate, of those, the most interesting would be these bottom three, contraposition, exportation, implication, and that deals with conditional propositions. So for example, if you have if P then Q, you could immediately infer that P is not the case or Q is the case. And that makes sense. The reason it makes sense is if you consider what's going on in if P then Q. So it's all about the necessary versus sufficient conditions. So the antecedent is sufficient for Q and the consequent is necessary for the antecedent. So there's only two valid um, inferences you can draw out of a mixed hypothetical syllogism, namely modus ponens and modus tollens. So that's what this is saying. So you have here modus ponens and here you have modus tollens. Those are the only valid possibilities. So keeping that sufficient versus necessary condition in mind allows you to make sense of those, um, those rules. To be sure, exportation, I think, is the most confusing of the three, and that may actually require a truth table to see exactly what's going on. But you still have that necessary versus sufficient distinction um, making that rule work. It's interesting, truth tables are actually not covered in the Substance Hill textbook until next chapter. I'm not sure if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I find truth tables a little bit tedious, but I mean, I think they're good nevertheless pedagogically, so maybe they, they should have introduced truth tables right away. But at any rate, let's move on. And moving on for the next video will be on section 3.2, truth value and truth functional connectives. Thanks for watching. Goodbye for now.